Well, some five weeks ago, there was a veteran lobster diver by the name of Michael Packard, who was commercially gathering lobsters off the coast somewhere near Cape Cod. Now, this was a lucky man because in 2001, he survived a plane crash. There were seven people on the plane, and four of them died. He was one of the survivors. So this is a very lucky man who has escaped death. Well, on June 11, 2021, off the coast, the coast of Cape Cod, he was descending into the waters to begin gathering lobsters when suddenly something slammed into him and everything went dark. You can probably imagine what happened here. He suddenly found himself in the mouth of a humpback whale. So according to his testimony, uh, he felt it uh, envelop him and he was trapped in its mouth and he could feel its jaws. These whales don't have teeth, but he could feel himself being squeezed and he still had his breathing apparatus on. And by his best guess, he was in the mouth of the whale for about 30 to 40 seconds. And he kept thinking, this is how I'm going to die. But finally, the whale surfaced and actually spit him out of the water. He flew up into the air and then hit the surface of the water with very minor injuries. Today, we're going to talk about a story, as you might guess, about a man who not only was just mouthed by a whale, but he was actually swallowed by some sort of large sea creature. And so we're going to ask you, if you would, to open up your Bibles to Jonah chapter 1. And we're going to be reading verses 3 to 17. Now, two weeks ago, we did our introduction to the book of Jonah. We looked at all the background. Last week, we talked about Jonah's calling. And I challenged everyone here that the Lord calls all of us into ministry and service in some way. And today, our topic is going to be running from God. And that is when the Lord calls you, when the Lord speaks to you, when the Lord presents something before you, sometimes the thing to which he calls us is not necessarily what we want to do. And the tendency or the, the temptation would be to run from that. And so we're going to see what that looks like. Jonah chapter 1, starting with verse 3 from the ESV, this is what the scripture says. This is right after the call, and it says, But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish, from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down to it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was threatened to break up. And then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner parts of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. And so the captain came to him and said, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God, perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. Verse 7. And then they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots so that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. And so they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. And then they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation and where do you come from and what is your country and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. And the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Verse 11, and then they said to him, what shall we do to you? That the sea may grow quiet, that the, that the sea may quiet down for us. For the sea grew more and more uh, tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea, and then the sea will quiet down for you. I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. And nevertheless, the men rowed hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. And therefore they called out to the Lord, O oh Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O oh Lord, have done as it pleased you. And so they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. And the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. 
The first thing that we see in this somewhat humorous story is in verse 3, we see that Jonah got up. He rose up. And at first, this seems like good news because the Lord tells Jonah, Jonah, arise. And so Jonah gets up. And we're expecting Jonah to say, all right, I'm standing up and I'm going to go do what you told me to do. But rather than standing up to obey the Lord, he rises in order to flee. He rises in order to run from God. The simple truth is that Jonah did not want to do what the Lord had called him to do. Why? Why would Jonah not want to do the, 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 the mission, to fulfill the mission that the Lord had given him? Well, we discussed this last week, and there were three basic reasons. The first one is that this was a long journey into the heart of Israel's enemy. You can see on the map there, on the bottom left, at the beginning of the red line, that's approximately where Jonah was. And at the top right, that is the city of Nineveh. This was a long journey into foreign territory. And remember, Assyria was Israel's enemy. And later on, they would be in active war. So this is not a place that you would want to go, and this is not a journey that you would want to take. And so one of the reasons why he's running from God is who wants to take this journey? But the other reason is that this was a confrontational message. He was to take this journey, go before the city of Nineveh, and basically say, all of you sinners need to repent. Who wants to do that? And would you survive that message? And the final reason, and we know this very clearly from the text that Jonah didn't want the Ninevites to be saved. Why? Well, this was Israel's enemy. If they didn't repent and the Lord destroyed Nineveh, this would be good for them politically. And so for these reasons, he runs from his mission. And of course, we must ask the question, what kind of sad view of the sovereignty of God did Jonah possess? In the ancient world, most gods were regional gods. And I use the word gods, of course, in lowercase. By leaving a territory, one could, it was understood, run away from the influence of that particular god. And so if the god of an area was against you, you leave the territory, and now the god no longer has power. But David lived a hundred, hundreds of years before the time of Jonah, and this is what David wrote about the presence of God. He said, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. And so even David knew hundreds of years before this that you couldn't run from God, that, that he was not a territorial God. And I think Jonah knew this as well. Nonetheless... He stands up in order to run from God. Where did he go? Well, first, he fled to a city called Joppa. And it is there on the coast. You can see on the map that it wasn't an Israelite territory. But Joppa was an ancient, his, was an ancient town with a rich history. Legend has it that it was the son of Noah, Japheth, who built the city after the flood. In the myth of Perseus, it was there on the coast of Joppa that he saved Andromeda from the Kraken. During the time of King David and King Solomon, they captured this city of Joppa, and it became a major port city. And so when Solomon was building the temple, all of the cedars of Lebanon, all of the wood, came to Joppa and was distributed from there. But when the civil war hit, then the country split and the Philistines took back the city of Joppa. So at this time, it's not an Israelite city. Here's a photo of Joppa in 1870. And then, of course, here's what it looks like today. So from Joppa, he prepares to leave the region. Now, I imagine Jonah entering into this city and trying to find a transport, and he comes across a, a wretched hive of scum and villainy, and he, he, he makes contact with the captain, and the captain comes to him and says, hey, I heard you're looking for passage to Tarshish. And Jonah says, yes, indeed, if it's a fast ship. And the captain says, fast ship? You've never heard of my ship? I've outrun Assyrian ships, not the local bulk cruisers, mind you, but I'm talking about the big Carillion ships. She's fast enough for you. What's the cargo? And Jonah says, myself, my staff, and no questions asked. 
And the captain says, well, what is this, some kind of local trouble? And Jonah says, let's just say I'd like to avoid any Yahwehistic entanglements. So Jonah pays the fee. He heads to Tarshish. And of course, we might wonder, why did Jonah choose the city of Tarshish? Well, we don't know the exact location of the city, but our best guess is that it was in Spain. And from the coast of Palestine all the way to Spain, that's a long run. But why there? Well, the rumor was that the people of Tarshish in Spain had never heard of Yahweh. That the Lord's name had never been made known there. And because the Lord wasn't known, conceivably you could go there and be out from under the umbrella of the Lord's sovereignty. This is what Isaiah said. And from them I will send survivors to the nations, to Tarshish, Paul, and Lude, who draw the bow, to Tubal and Javan, to the coastlands far away that have not heard my fame or seen my glory. And so the rumor was that Tarshish had not heard of the name of Yahweh and they had not seen his glory. So in Jonah's mind, he could flee there and he would be away from the presence and the power of the Lord. And so the plan seems like a pretty good plan until we reach verse 4. And it says, the Lord himself hurled a great wind upon the sea. A strong language. He He hurled a great wind upon the the sea. And in fact, it threatened to break up the ship. So the crew has no idea what's going on here. They're just innocent victims here. And so as this tempest hits the ship, they do a couple of things. One is they throw the cargo overboard to lighten the ship. I know nothing about nautical technology, but presumably that's beneficial in a storm is to have a lighter ship. But also, each mariner cried out to his own God. And this reminds us of Shakespeare's The Tempest, Act 1, Scene 1, when a similar storm uh, thrusts itself upon a ship, and and they, they all cry out, all is lost, to prayers, to prayers. So everyone is praying. And in a polytheistic world, you would expect everyone to be praying to different gods. And they go and they find Jonah. And they say, Jonah, pray to your gods too. We might as well just cover all of the gods just to cover our basis here. So let's pray to all of the gods. But then they get the sense that something's not right here. And they cast lots. And they discover that this evil has fallen upon them because of Jonah. And so they confront him. And he confesses that he is running from the Lord, which, of course, is completely irrational. It's so strange that he says, I fear the Lord, and the Lord made the land and the sea, and yet I'm running from him. By this time, verse 11, the storm is getting worse. And Jonah tells them to throw him overboard, but they don't want to because of blood guilt. They don't want to be you know, uh, held accountable for murder. And so they once again start rowing and they're trying to row to the shore and it doesn't work. And finally, the mariners pray to Jonah's God, ask him not to hold them accountable for his blood, and then they toss him into the Mediterranean. And verse 16 tells us that the mariners even fear the Lord and make sacrifices to him. Now, Jonah would have quickly drowned having been tossed into the sea, but the Lord intervenes. If you look at verse 17, it says specifically that the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow him. It wasn't a natural occurrence. The Lord appointed it, and there he remained for three days and three nights. Now, I want to make several points about the fish or the whale. Uh, One is that our animal identification system wasn't the same as theirs. We have a binomial nomenclature system where animals are given uh, two Latin names. And so uh, a gray wolf is Canis lupus, a red wolf is Felis rufus. You get the idea, right? So we have have a system of identifying animals into phylums and families and kingdoms and so on. And so the Hebrew word says fish but it could be in our vernacular, a whale. We don't really know. The other point I want to make is that most sea creatures, even the biggest ones, aren't actually capable of swallowing a human being. Even these large whales, they're big, but a human is still a pretty difficult pill to swallow, so to speak. 
Now, looking at all of the available animals in the ocean, there are two reasonable candidates that make the cut, so to speak. The first one is the whale shark. You've probably seen these before, and they tend to be rather docile. A lot of the scuba divers can swim with them, um, but they are large enough to possibly swallow a human being. Here's a photo that shows the dimension. So at the top, the gray whale shark is a fully grown large adult, and there on the middle right, you can see the size of a diver. So it seems reasonable that a diver could fit into that creature's stomach. The other candidate, and possibly the most likely, is, of course, the sperm whale. This is a very large whale, and they are known for swallowing squid whole, and so they regularly eat creatures that are the size of human beings. And so it seems reasonable that he could have been swallowed by one of these sperm whales. Now, if you look at the size ratio, there at the top is a very large, very mature sperm whale, and then you can see the diver in comparison. But regardless, this was not a natural occurrence. This was a supernatural event. It's clear from the text that the Lord appointed this to occur. He caused it. And we know that there aren't many sperm whales or whale sharks in the Mediterranean. They are there, but it's not super common. And we know the timing had to be perfect. The whale had to be swimming around right underneath the boat. And the creature, of course, would have had to want to swallow it. Also... When sperm whales swallow something, they usually crush it with uh, their bodies as it digests into their stomach. And so if Jonah had been swallowed by a sperm whale, he probably would have been crushed on the way down. Once he got to the stomach, now he's in complete darkness, uh, a low or no oxygen environment, sloshing around in the gastric acids. This would not have been fun. And it's actually been theorized that Jonah didn't survive, that he died, and then was resurrected when the whale vomited him upon the shore because Jesus referred to his own resurrection, being in the grave for three days and then coming out alive as the sign of Jonah. And based upon Matthew 12, 40, it's theorized that Jonah actually did die and then was resurrected. This is all speculation, but it's all pretty crazy. Whether he died or whether he survived, it's all a miracle that was appointed by the Lord. Now, here's why I personally believe that this is a true story and not some sort of parable to teach us a lesson. Number one is the Bible is filled with supernatural events. And so it should not surprise us when we run across an event that seems implausible. Now, this is what St. Augustine said about the story of Jonah and its believability. St. Augustine writes that pagans often like to poke fun at Christians about this story. And this is what he says. He says, I have noticed that this sort of question is a matter of much jest and much laughter to pagans. The answer to this is that either all the divine miracles are to be disbelieved, or there is no reason why they should be believed. We should not believe in Christ himself and that he rose on the third day if the faith of the Christians feared the laughter of pagans. And so he's making the same argument that basically, how can you say that Jesus rose from the grave and believe that and yet reject a miracle uh, such as this? If you believe one, you really need to believe the other. So it's, it's sophomoric to accept that Jesus rose from the grave, but God could not have caused a whale or a fish to swallow a human being. But the second thing is that Jesus spoke of this as an historical event, not a legend or a myth. This is what Jesus says, For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So that's the story from chapter 1. That's kind of what happened as we unpack it. But I want to get back to our topic, running from God. And so we always ought to ask ourselves, how should we then live? We look at Jonah chapter 1, what should our response be? And so one question I have is, why do people run from their calling? And it might be a big calling, a vocational calling. That the Lord doesn't want you to pursue this career. He doesn't want you to fall in the footsteps of your parents. Ever since you were a kid, you wanted to have this career. That the Lord says, nope, you're not doing that. I have a path for you. And that's a, a very big calling. 
But sometimes the Lord has small callings, local callings, timed callings. Why do we run from these? It usually comes down to a couple of things. The first one is that sometimes we just don't like the people or the ministry to which we are called. I don't know if you guys know this. Ministry can be ugly sometimes. And in fact, ministry would be great except for the people, right? (laughs) Because people are messy. And so you might have a ministry to grieving people. It could be uh, whatever it is, a disease, a death, uh, the loss of someone, whatever it might be. And, And to minister to grieving people can be hard. Because there's a flood of emotions, there's anger, and there's crying, and there's blaming God, and there's back and forth, and all of the the gamut of emotions that someone feels, and you have to be comfortable with that, dealing with people who are grieving. That's hard. What about the ministry of street people? You have people on the streets that do want to get right, they do want to change their lives, they do want to get out of it. And you have some that are pure criminals. You have some that like the nomadic lifestyle. You have some that are addicted to drugs or whatever it might be. And these ministries are complicated. They're messy. They're ugly. And you can actually get hurt doing it. You have ministry to people of other cultures. You have uh, people uh, ministering to people who are essentially your political enemies that don't agree with you. All this to say that sometimes we just don't like the ministry to which we are called because it's, it's difficult. And the second reason is that being involved in ministry is complicated and difficult. And in fact, if you want to have the easiest life possible, don't serve the Lord because it complicates your life. You can sit around, watch TV, play video games, do whatever you want to do, and not worry about anything. But to step into the arena of ministry makes your life difficult. It's worth it, but it's not easy. It takes time. It takes emotional resources. You may have to learn things. You may have to study If you're ministering to street people, you may have to read some books and do some research and find out what is this ministry doing? What's that ministry doing? What works? What doesn't work? You might have to actually put some time into it. And then people don't always respond well to your ministry. And there's always drama. But the other reason is sometimes we just don't want to live under scrutiny. Because when you're in charge of your own life, you can do whatever you want, however you want. No one cares. But the instant you step on this stage, the instant you put your name on something, the instant you're in charge of something, people are going to begin to watch your life and conduct. They're going to watch how do you treat your spouse? How do you talk about your spouse when he or she is not there? How do you treat your kids? Do you practice what you preach? I remember talking to a girl once that said she didn't want to be in ministry. And I said, why? And she said, because I want to be able to go to a bar Watch a baseball game, drink a beer, and I don't want anybody telling me how to live my life. And then, when you step into ministry, you will always have to make a decision. And whenever you make a decision, by the nature of choosing one thing, it meant that you rejected another. And people will always say, this was great, you made a great decision. And simultaneously, people will say, no, that was a poor decision. And you will have to live with public opinion. And so for all of these reasons, we want to run from God. We want to flee from from serving the Lord because it's, it's ugly, it's complicated. And I don't want to make this all a big downer. There's good things too. But this is one of the reasons why we flee. And the second point is that it's not even possible for us to run from God anyway. We can no more run from God than a goldfish can run from its owner inside of its little tank. We can pretend like we're running. We can feel like we're running, but we actually aren't running anywhere. It's really just disobedience. But like Jonah, God has something more abundant for us than a regular life. He knows that we will find the greatest satisfaction in our lives when we are aligned with him. And therefore, he's going to work to get us to where we need to be even when we try to run away. Because he is a loving father, he won't let us go. So what are the consequences from fleeing? Because it could be right now in your life 
God has told you, get up and go do this. And you're saying, nope, not going to do it. What are the consequences? Well, the first one is discipline. Now, let me share with you a verse that you won't like and that I don't like, and that if we were given the chance to snip one out of the Bible, this might be it. This is from Hebrews 12. Here's what it says. If you can't read it, just listen along. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. This isn't one that we want to read or hear, but the Lord still works the same way. That if you've confessed Jesus Christ as Lord, he is now your adopted father, and it is his responsibility to train us, and when we aren't willing to be trained to discipline us, to get us lined up so that we might share in his holiness. And this is why the phrase, God will never give you more than you can handle, is absurd. Because the Lord will do exactly that. He will give you exactly more than you can handle in order to break you. I mean, do you think being swallowed by a whale or a fish was more than Jonah could handle? Of course it was. Because the Lord was trying to train him in all righteousness. And so when we run from God, not because he's angry or mad or hates us, but he understands who we are, what we need, and what will bring us the most satisfaction in life, and that is following after what he has for us. And so his task is to align our lives with him, and when we refuse and we run, then he's going to work to bring us back, even though it temporarily might be painful. But the other consequence is community suffering. Now, let's look at the case of Jonah. First, we find that his disobedience was expensive to a lot of people. Number one, the cargo was all dumped into the sea. And that may seem like not a big deal, but maybe a a business was, was counting on that cargo. You ever had your Amazon order lost, right? It got dumped at sea because some fool in the Mediterranean decided to run from God, and now your order's late. Not a big deal, but it cost someone some money. The other thing is it probably did some damage to the ship. It terrified the crew. And this was also a bad witness for Yahweh. They asked Jonah, who are you? And he says, I fear the Lord, the one who made the sea and the land. Well, what are you doing? I'm running from him. Oh, that's great. This is an awesome God that you serve. And then, of course, and most importantly, the people of Nineveh, would not have been given a chance to make right with God. In our environment, when God is calling someone to serve or to be in ministry, the community suffering, the results can be multifaceted. It can simply come down to the music ministry is poor and distracting. The the audio-visual is sabotaging the service. The building and grounds are unkempt, and it it reflects a poor witness. Hospitality suffers. People don't feel cared for. Children are not being taught the scripture. Teenagers are getting their worldview from school and society. The administration of the church is weak, and things fall through the crack, and it makes us vulnerable to legal action. Mission work overseas are understaffed. There are no Bible translations for this particular group of people. There are no professors to to train up up and coming pastors and missionaries and in the case of Jonah no one will confront sin and so running from God is expensive for the community but here's the next one and that is anger and dissatisfaction it's been said that the most miserable creature in existence is not the person without God because they don't even know necessarily 
But the most miserable creature is the Christian, indwelled by the Holy Spirit, but fighting God, living in outright disobedience, fleeing from him. The most miserable person is the person for whom God has laid out a mission and that person refuses. Some years ago, a guy by the name of Kenneth Houck wrote a book called Antagonists in the Church. And if you've been in church life for very long, you know that troublemakers come in and out. And this author points out 20 red flags or 20 types of antagonists in the church. By the way, this is not a poor reflection on God. All hospitals have sick people. And so we should not be surprised when troubled people come in and out of church. This is normal. And in fact, if your church has no troubled people whatsoever, it means you're not reaching anyone. So it's, it's a good thing to have troubled people coming in and out. But we still have to deal with them. Back to the book. Dr. Rodney Harrison, director of the doctoral program at Midwestern Seminary, he took this book and began teaching it in seminar form, and he added a 21st point. Dr. Harrison suggests that one of the types of antagonist in the church comes in the form of a person who is called to ministry but is running from God. And so sometimes you'll have a person that is passionate about ministry. They're opinionated about ministry. They're well-read about ministry. And they see the things that are happening in church and they believe it could be done better. They believe it could be improved upon. They think it'd be, that it could be fixed. And God has put this passion in their heart and they see things a certain way and they know it could be done better and it's probably true. But guess what? They don't have the position to do anything about it because they've refused their calling. And so there, there they are. God is prompting them into ministry, but because they disobey, they're just here at church and everything they see is negative and they become a troublemaker. And he relates a story about a guy who was the biggest antagonist and he realized that this guy's fighting God. And the instant that they confronted this man and said, God is calling you into ministry, that's why you're so unhappy and causing so much trouble. And the guy left and immediately went to plant a church because he was able to plant it the way the Lord was calling him to do it. Here's the bottom line. Running from God is more expensive than obeying God. You have apparent freedom when you run away, but also a dull, aching and perpetual dissatisfaction. But here's the good news. You were created for a purpose. You were designed in such a way that the Lord would take your personality, he would take your life experience, he would take your passions, he would take your skills, he would take your spiritual gifts, and in the middle of that uh, uh, accumulation of different factors, he would put you in a ministry from which you would find satisfaction and from which you could change the world and from which you could invest in eternity. The most satisfied, the most happy people are those who apply their passion to the mission of God that he has given them. And in his service, walking his path, following his heart, you will find the ultimate joy. So the challenge here today is, it could be someone listening here today that God has a big thing for you. And you're running from that big thing. And I would just challenge you to take a look at this story and ask yourself, is it worth it? Is it worth it to run from God knowing you're not going to win this fight, you're going to be disciplined, or to simply say, if I just turn around and, and stop fighting and being ridiculous, follow the Lord, I'm actually going to be happier, and more satisfied. But what's more likely is for most of us in this room and listening that there are little areas of our lives where we're running from God. He's calling us to make a change in one small area. And like the little kid, we cover our face, and because we can't see, we think we're invisible. And the Lord is patient with us, but he's slowly disciplining us, trying to get us to come back to say, you will be the most happy, the most satisfied, and the most fulfilled when you align yourself with the path that I have laid out before you.